The Secrets of Star Trek is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to The Secrets of Star Trek, where we discuss the hidden layers and deeper meanings found in all the Star Trek TV series, movies, and more. And today we're discussing the latest episode of Star Trek Strange New Worlds called Children of the Comet. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today on the panel are Father Corey Stika. Hi, Father Corey. How's it going, Dom? And Jimmy Aiken. Hi, Jimmy. Children of the Comet, that was like a Stephen King horror movie, right? <laughs> yeah, they keep wishing people <laughs> into the comet. <laughs> yeah. So, folks, be sure to stick You're around. You're a bad man. You're a very bad man. <laughs> <laughs> bad man. Uh, let's stick around to the end of the episode, folks. We have plenty of listener feedback on our two most recent episodes, the last se- uh, episode of Picard, uh, season two, and the first uh, se- episode of Star Trek Strange New Worlds. Remember to like the Secrets of Star Trek on Facebook, where we're at facebook.com slash Media. Retweet us on Twitter where we're at SQPN and be sure to leave comments wherever you find us. We love to hear from you. I want to tell you about another show in the network you're sure to enjoy called American Catholic History, where you can find it wherever fine podcasts are found or at SQPN.com slash history. So, Jimmy, can you give us a recap of what happens in Children of the Comet? This week, our Let's Meet the Crew of the Enterprise episode focuses on Cadet Uhura. The crew tries to divert a comet that's going to smash into an arid desert planet and kill the primitive race on it. But the comet puts up a shield to defend itself, and they realize there's some kind of technology on it. So Uhura, Spock, La'an, and Sam Kirk beam down to try to establish communications. Sam Kirk gets injured, leaving Uhura, who is apparently the best linguistics genius since Hoshi Sato, to try to figure out how to make contact. She does so and discovers that the giant glowing Fabergé egg that controls the comet speaks in music, and we start replaying the ending of Close Encounters of the Third Kind. (laughs) But things are interrupted when a ship from an advanced civilization calling themselves the Shepherds shows up and declares that the Enterprise is desecrating the comet, which they regard as an ancient arbiter of life and death. The Enterprise is no match for the Shepherds, but Pike pulls a ruse, telling them that if they don't tow the Enterprise to safety, it will blow up and destroy their sacred comet thing. While the Shepherds are towing the Enterprise to safety, Spock's take, Spock takes the shuttlecraft Galileo and creates heat to break off chunks of ice from the comet. Per Newton's third law, that every action has an equal and opposite reaction, removing a big chunk of ice in Uh, changes the comet's trajectory. The ice then melts in the planet's atmosphere, bringing water to the desert planet and helping the natives. Later, after Uhura has decoded the musical message the giant Fabergé egg gave her, she reveals that the Fabergé egg was precognitive and knew the comet's fate. It predicted that Spock would separate the exact ice chunk he did, that the comet would miss the planet, and that its mission was to bring water to the planet. In private, number one cites the precognitive comet as evidence that just because you get a message from the future doesn't mean you'll understand it until later. She argues that Pike shouldn't assume his future uh, training ship accident is unavoidable and that there may be a way for him to save both himself and the cadets on that ship. The episode closes with him doing research on the cadets he's destined to save, so he seems to be taking number one's idea seriously. The end. I like that. I cuz uh yeah, we'll get to that, but uh, I like that the the idea that we're not going to just be spend the whole series wondering about mm-hmm. Pike's mental health. <laughs> you know, one, one thing one thing I do want to just start by commenting is this this is a a new thing in new Star Trek. It's actually better than a episode from a earlier series. It's a much better Comet episode than the Enterprise oh, yes. episode <laughs> of the Comet. Speaking of Ensign Hoshi Sato. Yeah. I was, oh, man, that was a terrible episode. <laughs> I was going to say that it, it is yet another inexplicable fascination with a chunk of ice floating through space. Like, <laughs> like yeah. Yeah. why are we well, so interested in comets? And this it, is it, more reasonable it, why it, they would be interested in it. Yeah. Well, uh, after they realize it's going to hit the planet. Yes. Um, now, in the other, in the Enterprise Comet episode, I don't, I don't remember what that was called, but it's the 
Archer's Comet episode. It's like, yeah, okay, suck up to the captain if that's what you need to do for your career. <laughs> um, but okay, Uhura tells us in voiceover in, I guess, her log at the beginning of the episode that they're studying the behavior of an ancient comet. Science point one, all comets are ancient. <laughs> yes. They're not making, they're, they're, you know, they, they formed billions of years ago. Uh, science point number two, there are a trillion comets in our own solar system. Why do you care about this one? This is like saying we're, we're on a mission studying an ancient rock. It's <laughs> like, okay, there are bazillions of rocks and they're all ancient. Why do you care? Um, once they discover it's going to hit the planet, well, that makes it interesting, but I have no idea why they're studying it before that. And then, by the way, that episode was Breaking the Ice. Yes. Uh, breaking, right, because the Vulcans. Okay, yeah. We, yeah, we talked about that a couple <sighs> <of> years ago. <laughs> was it that long ago? I thought it was more. <laughs> I'm more traumatized. I think it's more recent. It was April yeah. of 2020 <laughs> that the game was released really? that. We discussed it in uh, a little earlier than that, even in 2019, but it, we released it in 2020. <laughs> so uh, let's talk about this one, though. Uh, it starts with we get to see the the aliens on the planet, this primitive culture, these desert dwelling uh, people who are interesting looking. What's that? So they're on Tatooine. The, yes, on Tatooine. Mm. We have some Tuscan Raiders. <laughs> <laughs> but th it's an interesting looking new species. They're not just a head bump uh, alien. They, they, they have a whole full face prosthetics. So I, so I thought that was an, a nice touch. And they play utterly no role in the plot. They're just MacGuffins who are in danger. Yes, they exist we, to be potential victims. They don't even speak. We just hear a laughter at the end, and that's yeah, about yeah. it. Um, then we have uh, Uhura showing up for dinner at the captain's table, uh, or being having a prank played on her by Ortegas, the helmsman, uh, who had told her to make sure you get dressed up in your full dress uniform. Uh, and apparently... Pike prefers a casual atmosphere. And I like the fact that he kind of is very relaxed. So he's very different from Picard or other ones. Yeah. He, although he reminds me a lot more of, if I was to compare him to another captain, he's a very Cisco like right mm -hmm. down to the fact that he likes to cook. He's making barbecue ribs, yeah. which is good. I was going to say, he's also kind of like Archer. He's he, yeah. Archer could yep. be relaxed. That's true. That's true. Uh, I love the fact that the captain's again, the captain's cabin has a big kitchen in it that he does cooking at. Like, I just mm -hmm. uh, I, I just I'm loving this more and more, like the, their design of the ship and just the way they've got Archer. I'm sorry, Archer, you got me. Uh, Pike in the midst of this this relaxed atmosphere with this crew. And uh, we not only do we get to, to learn more about Uhura, we get to learn no, more about the, this new character who just right. showed up at the end of the previous episode, the new chief engineer, Hammer. Who is right. in Anar? Anar, a subspecies of Andorians that we were introduced to in the fourth season of Enterprise, an episode called the Anar, uh, mm. and they are this. The subspecies is blind and dwell in Andor's. I was going to say ice Andoria's icy regions, but. All of Andoria is icy. So they're in the icier right. <laughs> regions of the planet, and they were thought well, to be and, mythical for a while. And, and Bruce Horak, who plays Hammer, is himself blind. Oh, really? The oh, actor himself is blind. Wow. So, nice catch. which makes it, yeah. So, a <laughs> lot, little more, uh, little more, uh, brings more realism to the crew or the character. Uh, just wanted to mention real quickly, though, you know, Tom, you mentioned the, the, like the kitchen and everything. I think this is the first captain's quarters where I'd actually want to live there. Yes, I agree. Mm -hmm. I mean, Cisco's, uh, uh, Picard's, like none of them had like quarters that all were all that comfortable or uh, nice looking. This is like, wow, this is nice. Um, uh, th there is this wonderful moment where they're pranking Uhura, uh, both Hammer and Spock, about his inability to see, and she offers to help and is like, Oh, it's just because I'm blind. Do you, do you think I can't do do my job or whatever? <laughs> it just they're relentless to this poor cadet. Uh, so it's I, funny. I, I like I like a bit of dialogue they then have. It's it's a little bit paint by numbers, but it's still fun. Where um, Uhura, after being pranked like that, is trying to make conversation, and she says, "So I understand the the Anar has a form of precognitive ability." And Hammer says, I knew you were going to say that Be <laughs> yeah. because you sensed my question before I asked it, because everyone always asks that. <laughs> yes, yeah. that was good. Well, 
And then we have the scene where Spock throws like a carrot or something at him and he catches it. Yeah. Spock yeah. purposely sent the telepath- telepathic message. I'm going to throw this at you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> nice catch. Indeed. Especially if the actor is blind. Right. Yeah. Uh, so speaking, speaking of, so the prosthetics and everything, the makeup and everything, Mm -hmm. Spock's sideburns are out of control. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, wow. Not only are they ridiculously long, much longer than the sideburns in the original series, they're Uh curvy. It's like, wow. I mean, dude, get those under control. Also, Pike's quiff is completely out of control. Yeah. Um, you know, it's like, okay, how much hair gel did you use to get it to spike up in front like that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that is quite a, a do that he's going to go in there, which, you know, I'm, I, I suppose I'm a little jealous of, but uh, he does get some some uh, nice hair gel. You got to look there. good. You captain, you got to look good. Yeah. So... <laughs> Uh, we, speaking of Spock, we have this conversation over the dinner table. Part of it is, is uh, someone's telling an embarrassing story. I think it was Pike telling him. Uh, yeah, Pike telling yeah, an yeah. embarrassing story. And Spock asks, I, I do not understand the human propensity for to laugh at others' misfortune. It seems impolite. And uh, Christine Chapel, who's there, says that's why it's funny. You know, because it's, mm-hmm. uh, it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's she's imp- implying that. Because it's slightly naughty, that's a that's a, a part of human humor, like our, our sense or of humor. not naughty but embarrassing. Embarrassed, yeah. right? But the impoliteness of it might also be kind of, you know, that it's mm-hmm. it's outside the, the the behavioral norm. Yeah, this this transgressive aspect of humor is r- robustly discussed in the science of humor studies that have been done. Mm. Um, partly, so humor and laughter seems to be a behavior that, I mean, it's a kind of play. And play is something you do when you are uh, simulating an experience in a safe way that you may have to later face for real. Like, Mm -hmm. this is why kittens Mm -hmm. and puppies play fight. It's because as adult dogs and cats, they're going to need to fight. They're going to need to handle themselves in a fight. So they anticipate that. They don't realize that's what they're doing, but they anticipate that by play, where it's fun to simulate this kind of danger so you learn how to handle yourself. Well, humans being more social creatures um, that, you know, communicate in a more robust way, we have social danger. And and humor is a form of social play that, among other things, can help us prepare to deal with embarrassing experiences where we lose face. Mm -hmm. And so it's a form of simulated danger and it needs to be fun. Otherwise, we wouldn't do it. But it also needs to involve some element of risk. Um, Otherwise, it wouldn't perform its training function. And so at least one theory of how you can understand humor is as a form of social play that intrinsically does need to involve like risk of loss of face or embarrassment. Mm, Interesting. Uh, Explains dad humor a bit. So (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) uh, we also learn, uh, uh, now that we're learning about Uhura, we learn that she's from Kenya, which is, doesn't quite just, just uh, disprove yeah. your Ken- Kenya could be one of the United States of Africa. Exactly, exactly. Mm-hmm. So we, that's still a possibility. Uh, we also learned she speaks thirty-seven languages, which apparently many of them are local. Like there's a lot of languages, tribal languages, uh, regional she says languages. There's twenty-two. Yeah, in Kenya. Yeah. But uh, so she's apparently a whiz with languages, which you know you, we've already known that Yora was special. So that that's uh, interesting there. Uh, but when Pike asked her where she sees herself in ten years, she she kind of balks at it and, she, and says, uh, I don't know if I'm going to even stay in Starfleet, which is a surprise to everyone because as Spock kind of admonishes her later, her later you know, there are a thousand people who would, who would have given their eye teeth to be where you are here. So for you to say, I'm not sure I actually really want to be here. It's kind of a, a slap in the face to all the people who are here. And so yeah, he, he said, he gives her a implicit, figure yourself out or get out of the way and open up the slot for someone who wants it message. Right. Yeah. Um, Although this is something that is a little, 
I mean, it's it, it, the military can work different in their culture than it does in ours. But uh, if you asked a typical, you know, uh, person in the military today, where do you see yourself in 10 years? They might not envision themselves being in the service. So they might want to oh. complete their hitch or achieve their certain goals and, and then move into civilian life. Well, this is this is a little bit different, though, um, than like if you'd asked me when I was in the Air Force uh, as an enlisted uh, mm-hmm. member, where did I see myself in the Air Force in 10 years? And I, I would have said no. And obviously I didn't. Uh, she's there as a cadet. And so she it'd be like asking someone at the at the uh, Air Force Academy. Mm, yeah. Who is a cadet. Mm. Do you see yourself staying in the air, you know, going into the Air Force after your time in 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 the academy and of course at that point the answer is yes because that's kind of what you signed up for at that point um and this is you know this is a little more uh starfleet is kind of understood to be more of a long-term commitment than it is um yeah. than like the the u.s military would be you know we, we don't hear a lot of at least there's not a lot of stories in 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 star trek of people who leave starfleet it's almost seen as a a denial or a rejection of Starfleet to yeah. leave it at somewhat early. So I think that's somewhat unrealistic though, but yeah, yeah that's you know, true. It's, that's it's, not true. Our, it's just not our culture. I yeah. think of it as a lot of Starfleet in Star Trek, a lot like more, more like the um, British Navy in the age of sail, the early mm-hmm. 1800s, especially because those ships, those ships went out for months or years, even at a time mm-hmm. and didn't come back. And it was a commitment of your life to the sea and that sort of thing. And, you know, I feel like in many ways, Starfleet is supposed to be a little more like that. So I can see that. And if you're a cadet at the Air Force Academy, say, and you are, you got a, a summer, you know, they, they get a summer cruise on board a ship an early, you know, and they get a prime slot that thousands of other or hundreds mm-hmm. of other cadets at the Academy competed for. And the captain of that asks you where you see yourself in 10 years. You're supposed to say, no matter what you think you're expected to say, Oh, I expect to be excelling and reaching, becoming a captain or, you know, whatever, you know, or uh, actually in the air force uh, squadron commander or something. So yeah, uh, I I can see why, why they, they wrote it like that, but. uh, Well, and it's it's supposed to be part two of, of seeing her, her where she's almost a little too honest. Sometimes, yeah. you know, she talks about that as she's nervous walking in there. It's like, you know, that she's almost too honest sometimes in conversation. And that's part of it. And, and other part, too, is, you know, if, if you're living a life of service that, you know, Starfleet is seen as, you know, serving. Um, there are going to be times where you're going to question, am I really going to continue with this for the rest of my life? You mm-hmm. know, people, whether it is in ministry or military service or government service or anything like that, there are going to be points where you can say, is this something I really see myself in 10 years doing? Well, and that brings up another aspect of Starfleet, which is the idealistic aspect of it. And in that respect, it's kind of analogous to the Peace Corps mm-hmm. today. And but I it's still in our culture, if you go into the Peace Corps, do you? you might not plan on being in the Peace Corps in 10 years. You may be planning a more limited commitment than that. Yeah. I'm not sure how, yeah, I'm not sure whether the the understanding is career or short term. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. So one thing I do uh, that she says is she's an orphan and her parents Mm -hmm. died in in a shuttle accident. Uh, They both were professors at the university of Nairobi and had expected to attend there, but where they, where they taught, uh, but then couldn't, not not because they wouldn't admit her, but because it's just emotionally she couldn't attend after her parents were killed. And uh, I think Pike so, is so, so being an orphan boy, she was apprenticed to a pirate. I mean, a pilot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think Pike is very kind with her revelation that maybe she doesn't think she belongs. I mean, he he is uh, very understanding, and uh, again, P- Pike comes out as a as a good leader, a compassionate leader, uh, a good captain. I, I just keeps reinforcing that for me. Um, speaking of Pike, when he asks her where she sees herself in 10 years, there is a very yeah. noticeable skip in his speech yep. because as he realizes where he will be in 10 years, like this is a standard question he asks cadets, but this time it's different because he knows mm-hmm. he has a fo- that, that uh, pro- prophecy of the future for him. So I thought that was a right. very good, subtle moment that they had there. That was really good. That was good. And of course, you know, the, the question of the 10 years, uh, as far as Star Trek lore is concerned, we know exactly where she's going to be. The same exact spot she is now at the <laughs> yes. comms of the Enterprise. That's so. right. 
Uh, Speaking of which, I like the fact that they play on they 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 utilize and they later made a really big deal out of it. But they they utilized her humming Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. Nichelle Nichols would do that. And I mean, we see Nichelle Nichols like in the Nomad episode, she's humming, which is what gets her brain wiped. And right. she plays musical instruments and she sings in Charlie X. And so there I like that they're tying into that aspect of Nichelle Nichols's performance of the role. Yes. Yes. I, uh, yeah. Uh, yet again, a good casting of of a of a role that was played by a different actor mm-hmm. previously. And it's a it's a really compatible casting. Uh, the, I think There's, I like this actress. Yeah, there's there's even one line later on where um, when they're down on the comet where Laan says to her, so are you going to are you going to get us killed or get us out of here? And Uhura says right now, I'd say it's pretty much a toss up. And her delivery of the line was so much like Nichelle Nichols Mm -hmm. that Mm -hmm. I took note of it. It's like, wow, that was that was a really good reading that, you know, even though she's not trying to be Nichelle Nichols, Mm -hmm. that was that was a very close reading. Now this, oh, one one thing um, I forgot to mention when we were talking about Ahura's parents dying, it's kind of interesting connection. Another connection with with the original with the actor, uh, Celia Rose Gooding, her father died in nine eleven. Oh mm, wow. wow! When she was one year old, mm. so she, she was a- she was born in two thousand, and her her father died a year later on nine eleven. Oh wow, interesting. You know, speaking of the actors, by the way, playing, uh, you know, the role of the, the way other actors did, I have to say that Ethan Peck as mm-hmm. as Spock plays Spock a little more straight and unemotional than Nimoy did in the first season of TOS. Um, yeah, that's because of Nimoy was still figuring out how to play Spock. He, yeah. he's, he commented on in the first few episodes of the first season, he was like this. Oh, what was the term he used? Um he was like barking orders like he was on a Navy ship. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. But but Spock was lo- like even th- uh, through the run of of TOS mm-hmm. was looser. Now, you could say that's 10 years later and Spock has kind of figured yeah. out how to be a little, you know, how to balance things a little more. Uh, but uh, I just thought that was interesting how he's playing it a little more straight and younger, I guess, is, mm-hmm. the, is, is the idea. Um Pike, by the way, says he knows the names of the cadets he saves in his future accident. He, in this yeah, conversation creep, he has with number one. Creepy. He just starts naming them. Yeah. Right. And it's and knowing their names and that they're the ones he saves is what keeps him on this path. Because number one is like talking about you can try to change your future. And he's like, but if I change my future, will they die? And, and so. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I so I, I'm, I'm fine with him dealing with the aftermath of Pike's revelation. But I don't think we need too much more on that. Yeah. I don't want it to become a recurring, what's this week's Pike's internal ruminations on his fate going to be? Because I think that'll wear thin pretty quickly. I don't mind having it last episode and this episode, but it doesn't need to come up that often. And frankly, I'm not sure what they can really do here because we don't just, because we've seen him in that wheelchair and we see him go back to Talos four, unless they're going to decanonize the menagerie parts one and two, he's not going to avoid that accident. Right. No. Well, right. and I, I don't think th- they, they seem to be very clearly leaning towards that. And I'm, I'm wondering if now, cause now we've got, he, you know, he looks up the, the names are, you know, all those different children at this point that he's going to be saving. And I wonder if now it's there, there's going to steer his story where it shows how that knowledge of his death is going to guide him in being a better captain and coming to that point. Yeah. Instead yeah, of wrestling with it, just accepting it and moving and on. If the, and if they can do that, that's fine. But it shouldn't be coming up every episode of the series. I agree. I agree. But, I wouldn't, no, I wouldn't I, want I, that. I, I hate to say it, but it does feel like it is the season arc. I am kind of hoping they'll, they'll treat it like Doctor Who treated a lot of their season arcs where it's it comes up every once in a while and it's a little insert into a few episodes but otherwise it's not a major part of every episode and yeah. i'm hoping that's kind of where they're going to go now with this so we've got this comet it's and they've learned that it's going to hit the planet on this go round and kill everyone on the planet so they they come up with a plan to move it out of the way and uh, i'm like what no prime directive in picard's day you would let that comet smash into that planet and kill <laughs> those people because federation ideology right well yeah 
They even poke at, well, they, they, they poke at that. You know, he says we're yeah. not allowed to, you know, Pike says we're not allowed to uh, interfere with the direct development of the people on the planet, but that doesn't mean we can't be like guardian angels, basically. You they know, were. Kind of kind of push the comet out of the way so that they don't, they have the opportunity to develop. There were like times in, in earlier series where they had these disasters coming. It's going to destroy this species, but that's, we have to let it happen. Like that's not natural development. That's ending the development. Like, Mm-hmm. You, like you're not going to, I don't know, like, well, it's not the, like we're trying the, to preserve the timeline here. <laughs> the ideology is that if we, if we interfere, if we let these people survive, they could, I don't know, become the Daleks or something. Right. And so we just can't interfere with anything going on in the universe until you have warp drive in that case we can. Yeah. It's just this, yep. this is, as Spock points out in the Q&A, has it ever occurred to you that the prime directive is indefensible? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, I like Pike's line, by the way. We got a planet to save before breakfast. I love this job. <laughs> which yeah. Is, yeah, which is great. Um, you got some good one liners in this. Yeah, uh, they, they but then, as you said, Jimmy, they learn that the, the comet has a force field and there's an alien building slash city, something inside it. Um, then uh, we so we have to go down to the surface, uh, which brings back Mustache Kirk, who is uh, the, some fans are starting to call him that Mustache Kirk instead of uh, uh-huh. Sam Kirk. Nice. Um, and, and they hang this, a lantern on his mustache because yeah. Pike says he likes it. Yeah, yeah Pike right is a briefing. This <laughs> non sequitur about uh, Sam Kirk's mustache, and then Sam Sam's like, hey, you could try try uh, growing one. It'd be nice. Although we we saw Pike had one recently, so that's fine. Uh, they have this, I'm uh, going, scene. I still, it's like, okay, that mustache is pretty weak. <laughs> yeah, it's still pretty weak. He needs a better mustache. Uh, they have this, uh, scene where Spock, uh, Uhura, La'an, and Kirk are suiting up for their EVA. It's a very quippy scene. I've noticed, mm-hmm. like, the dialogue here is very, uh, back and forth quippy. I um, love a line that they give Chapel, where she injects Uhura, and Uhura's like, ow, you could have warned me. And Chapel says, then you would have known it was going to hurt. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, then um, they beam down. Oh, oh, well, we should, because it'll come up later. In that yep. same scene, um, when she gets around to Spock, he's like, I can handle any pain you can cause. And she's now you're just toying with me. <laughs> <laughs> that was not my intention. Um, but yes. clearly a little flirty line there uh, yes. from Chapel, which Uhura will bring up later. Yes. Um, so a uh, little tip, when you are in an alien environment and you see a big creepy egg, do not approach. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this applies whether you're in the movie Aliens or yeah. you're in Star Trek. <laughs> any any big creepy egg in a dark space, stay away from it. Yes, that's that's you just go back to the ship, just blast it from space. We will nuke it from orbit, as they say in the, in the movie Aliens. Uh, so Kirk gets <laughs> gets electrocuted because you, you know Ortegas reminds me of the Lady Space Marine from Aliens. Yes, Mar- yeah, Martinez, and, I think, yeah. Yeah, and all those space marines from Aliens, they deserve to die. Oh, yes. Um, but Ortegas doesn't deserve to die. I no, like no. Her. I mean, Bill Paxton was was great in that one. He Although was, her <laughs> anti-sideburns yeah. are also out of control. <laughs> that hairdo <laughs> is a little weird. Um, so Kirk does, it's like his first uh, away mission and walks right up to the darn thing and gets zapped and the shields go up and they're stuck there. So we have the, the tension of the episode is, well, what part of the tension of the episode is Kirk is dying, shields are up. How do we get him out of there and save them all and save the planet? Um, I, I like that they are able to temp, to restart his heart with using the little tricorder probe as a defibrillator. Yeah, mm-hmm. I like that. I like that. In fact, I, I would think that the suits would have like auto dock mm-hmm. you know, medical things built into them. That, that would be interesting, too. Yeah. Uh, Uhura tries to joke with Spock to break the tension. He doesn't get it. And so he says, I find the best way to relieve tension is to apply rigorous logic. <laughs> she says, well, there's also that option. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> So then we have the big alien ship that's uh, more powerful than the Enterprise shows up and uh, that they, s- they never noticed, by the way, it just all of a sudden is there. Yeah, good, good. good whoever's on sensors. Good job. Um, they say that the comet is called Mahanit, one of the ancient arbiters of life. And if oh. the Enterprise tampers with it, they will destroy the Enterprise. And, and their name translates as to the Universal Translator as the Shepherds. 
Yeah. So they're kind of shepherding a shepherd and arbiter. Like, sure. Okay. Um, I could not. They kept using Mahanit, and I, I. That's almost the Hebrew word for automobile. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so you can so drive in, my car. <laughs> yeah. In in Hebrew, automobile is Mahanit. Oh wow! <laughs> and and every uh, every time they were talking about uh, Mahanit, I'm I keep thinking I, in Hebrew. I want to put twenty liters of of gasoline in my Mahanit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, uh, the the aliens, uh, the shepherd talks about the will of the automobile and the preordained future that they have. Yeah. Uh, and Pike bristles at the concept of. A preordained future, the the that the future mm -hmm. is set, and we it is not up to us to. So it's sort of As almost you like do. They, yeah, they almost have like a Calvinist's uh, predestination, preordained. Mm -hmm. The future is set; you can't change it. Sort of approach to things, uh, and and Pike doesn't like that idea for obvious reasons uh, about his his uh future um, what what I liked in this initial scene is as he's talking to the shepherd captain. Ortegas and number one are doing all kinds of stuff on their consoles silently researching that ship. Mm -hmm. And then, and Pike knows they're doing it. And at a certain point he puts the shepherd guy on hold and turns around and says, what do you got? And mm -hmm. that's when they brief him. Like they are way out of our class captain. Yes. Um, but I like how without saying anything, they're doing this job and Pike knows they're doing it. And it shows mutual confidence and tr competence and trust. What you mean a Starfleet crew that's actually competent and does what they're supposed to do without having a nervous breakdown or is having that to be possible? Ordered? Yes, or just you know talk about how we're all in this together. Uh, so uh, meanwhile, Uhura is trying to figure out how things are you know how to translate the writing in the in this cavern and on the egg. Uh, and as she works, she starts she starts humming to herself again, which Spock notices as a sign of distress, telling her the situation was less dire than it had been. Plus, Kirk had found the one thing to avoid, which increased our odds of success, which uh, <laughs> that reminded me of something funny, like uh, from Princess Bride. At least uh, you cleverly discovered the the, the fire of the uh, lightning sand. Uh, anyway, Uhura asks, is this your version of a pep talk? And he says well yes <laughs> i've like, been working on them yeah 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 <laughs> <laughs> keep working on it <laughs> um yeah. so the and then his later one she says that one hit better yeah yeah. Yes. uh so the cave reacts to you who is singing and we discovered you know that the three tones uh, i, I yeah. know they they almost use the close encounters musical phrase at one point yes yep. it was that was kind of interesting i Intentional, an homage. I think uh, it was. Yeah, um, I, I like the I like the whole conversation about you know music, music as math, math, music yep. as a language. I mean, that's and I, I've said before, you know, like in in Discovery where they had different form of language. It's kind of nice when they actually explore that that language is more than just spoken words as we understand it. Right, right. That there's other ways that language could be could be done by alien races that are different than what we do. Yeah, this this aspect, I mean, I'm fine with it speaking with music and stuff, but this aspect of, okay, linguistics genius, figure this out for us. I was a little disappointed with it because it doesn't really go, it was obvious to me the writers are not linguists because mm -hmm. you've got all these symbols on the outer shell of the egg that they've identified as symbols. The first thing you would do is scan the surface of the egg and have your iPad start classifying those symbols and breaking them into groups and saying, okay, how many symbols do we have in this in this alphabet? What does that tell us? Is it or in this in this uh, script? Is, is it an alphabet? Is it a syllabary? Are these logograms? Those are things you can figure out just by looking at the text in front of you, mm -hmm. and and they didn't have her do. Uh, they they, it looked like she she just was holding her notepad in front of her face and staring at it and not doing any real linguistics work. Um, and then, of course, this may be a this may be a supertonal language. Um, you know, you should be. This is science fiction. You should be thinking. What could these symbols represent? Are they words? Mm -hmm. Are they musical notes? Are they pheromones? Are they electrical impulses? Are they 
hot and cold vibrations, you know, you can't assume that it's going to be spoken language as humans have it. Even humans have multiple different modalities of language, so including mm -hmm. sign language, which is gestural, spoken language, which uses uh, words much of the time. But actually, we have, mus we have musical languages here on Earth. And I don't just mean like Chinese, where you have tones that affect the meaning of words. We have straight out musical languages. There are uh, people, and I forget where they live, but there are uh, people who live in a kind of mountainous terrain where the human voice doesn't carry well, and they have a whistle language where you whistle different musical notes and it communicates your message. And they're like a shepherding people. So when they're out with their flocks on the mountains, they can whistle to each other to communicate. Hmm. Yeah, it's um, it kind of reminds me a little bit of that episode of Enterprise. Again, which we're going back to Hoshi, where they have mm -hmm. her, you know, on this alien ship, the creepy ship full of dead bodies, where she has to quickly translate the language. In fact, Enterprise did this a lot with Hoshi, where she has she translates oh, yeah. the language like, you know, in 15 minutes and it's like, and sp start speaking it. Like, I know we've got a limited amount of time and they can, but you can do a little bit of this. So, yeah. Um, uh, I did like I mean, Sp Spock's discussion of music as being math and their fundamental, it's their fundamental nature of music, musical notes that makes them plays into the ear and sort mm -hmm. of says it's music is universal in that sense. And I did like that. That goes back to the Greeks. So yep, like yep. Pythagoreans and Aristotelians, they were all over this music math stuff. And that's and I, I, the conversation, especially about, you know, thirds and fifths and octaves and stuff like that was, <laughs> was kind of good to hear because you know, I, I think there is uh, music is seen more more of art than science sometimes mm -hmm. and math. But there's a combination of both. It really is both an art, but it's also oh, a, yeah. a science and a math. So. Yep. So somehow the singing lowers the force field. Uh, she, she sings and the force uh, field goes writing. down. Weak writing. Weak writing. She just says, let me try this. And then suddenly the force field comes down and it's like, come on, you can do better than that. <laughs> you could understand it, Jimmy. She said, we are not a threat. Don't, don't keep us trapped here. We need to get off of this, this rock. You didn't hear that? Yeah. No, I'm kidding. One of the things that she does is because she's singing the traditional uh, Kenyan folk song, the comet starts retransmitting it out like that so that the Enterprise picks it up and uh, Pike recognizes it and uh, as it, it it recognizes the song as the one that Uhura was singing earlier. So uh, they mm -hmm. know that they're alive down there. So that, that was. A and, and that they don't ex say this, but that could be headcanoned as this ship is the comet thing is trying to communicate. Yeah. yeah. And so it's re it's rebroadcasting this so that they'll know that they're in some kind of communication. Right. So but then why are you got your shield up? <laughs> right. Right. So once the shield comes down, um, they, they beam them off and uh, Kirk is going to be OK to die another day. And Spock comes up with his idea to play dead next to the comet. So the shepherds have to save them to save the comet. And while they're doing that, Spock uses the heated shields of the shuttle, the Galileo, to sublimate the comet's surface, which creates a, which not only just uh, breaks off a piece, but it also creates a. Newton's reaction, you know, op, each equal and opposite reaction, it pushes it off course. Uh, and so we have that just enough, just enough. And we have that thrilling, you know, dramatic scene. Yeah. And again, this science glitch comets do not throw off all that stuff that that um, that Spock is flying through with these huge chunks. Yeah. If they did, they would exhaust themselves and wouldn't be comets anymore. They. <laughs> It it normally takes you don't have I mean yes comets do break up over time but not this fast they're not throwing off all that stuff right um, they also could have explained what Spock is doing a little more clearly yeah mm. yeah I felt that was you only understood really what it was doing at the end after it all had happened yeah so the the, the additional moisture from the comet will make the planet thrive ecologically. Uh, uh, yeah. Science, another science point. Uh, no, it won't. Um, <laughs> yeah. A single comet does not carry enough water to permanently affect an entire planetary ecosystem. Yeah. Well, also when all that rain landing in a desert area is going to wash yeah. away all those people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yay. It's raining. Oh no. Why is everything washing <laughs> away? Oh, we're all dead. Um, yeah, it's like in, in I forget where it is in the Bible, but there's uh, a um, there's a passage 
literally translated, it's you betrayed me like a wadi. Uh, and and a wadi yeah. is a, in in here in English we call them washes. But if, yeah. what it is is it's like a dry riverbed that is dry most of the time. But then suddenly, when the rain comes to the desert, you can have a flash flood, and and it'll mm-hmm. go down the washes or down the wadis, and unexpectedly, if you're in that wadi when it happens, you can be betrayed like a wadi. It's like a wall of water that comes at you. Some in some cases, yeah. yeah. So oh, yeah. have have fun learning experience, people on the planet. <laughs> You've got a new <laughs> phrase. You've been betrayed like a wadi. So uh, the they talk about was you know. The fact that the comets, people, whoever had programmed the the egg, had this idea in they had pre this precognition of the events. Um, was it the will of Mahanit? Uh, the shepherd guy asks, you know, basically finishes off before he leaves by saying, "To Pike, perhaps in the future you shall not be so quick to judge the faith of others," which is an interesting point. Faith has come up before with Pike. We saw that in mm-hmm. season two of Discovery, which he has treated it uh, respectfully. So yeah. uh, I wonder if it, faith is going to be something that they address more in in New World, Strange New Worlds. It would be interesting if, I mean, it'd be nice if they do it and it'd be nice if they do it nicely. Yeah. Um, Pike admits to the shepherd guy after the water dissolves in the atmosphere that it, he's witnessed a miracle, which, you know, it, from a certain point of view, sure. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, but from another point of view, no. Um, and then that's when the shepherd guy delivers the perhaps in the future, you will not be so quick to judge the faith of others. And earlier, Pike had this line about, oh, these people are zealots. And I just thought this is a little ham fisted. I appreciate the point mm-hmm. they're making mm-hmm. that there's more than one way to look at things, including from a perspective of faith and that the perspective of faith um, should not simply be dismissed. It should be treated with respect and uh, and taken seriously. So I very much appreciate all that. But the fact I appreciate their message does not mean I'm going to be excusing bad writing. And and I thought the message was delivered in a way that was too ham fisted. Mm. So that we we get left with several questions: mm-hmm. Who made the comet? How many more of these? arbiters of life are out there and was it all a coincidence uh that that this these events happened so that that's sort of left unanswered maybe mm-hmm. I, I would just suspect we're not we're never going to see these guys again and this is a one-off sort of thing which is mm-hmm. fine it's good to leave it's fine to leave things unanswered and open-ended i'm fine with that i want to see the Fisarius of the first federation again <laughs> yes <laughs> <laughs> the corporate might maneuver Let's bring back tranya <laughs> so um, I know this is very Cobra Might Maneuver-ish uh, in a way. Uh, mm-hmm. Well, the, the creature definitely looked like it. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, Although he had a beard, that was interesting. It's because it's, he's got, otherwise got this gray, lumpy, weirdo head. Big and, eyes. And, and for yeah. once they put hair on, on one of these guys and it happened to be a beard in this case. Normally when you have big, lumpy headed aliens, they don't have hair. Yeah, yeah. CGI aliens. Yes. Yep. So we, we, we finish off the episode with number one, tell, as we mentioned before, telling Pike, you know, what if you had that vision of your future in order to change the future for the better so that everyone can survive uh, that event, you know, not just those cadets. And that's, we have uh, him looking up the names of these children who, (laughs) I mean, obviously he would be a lot more work to find them in the database because they have, fairly common names. There'd probably be thousands of kids with the same names, but whatever. Maybe he looked them up before. Maybe that's what it is. Anyway. Sure. Uh, final thoughts on this episode, Father Corey? Uh, nothing else. No, was, I enjoyed it. It, yep. was, it was a fun episode. Jimmy? I don't think it was as good as last episode, but it was still enjoyable. Yeah, it was, it was good. A good first, a good beginning. So let's get to our listener feedback. We get a bunch of feedback. Uh, our first feedback comes from our episode on the final final episode of Picard season two, which uh, we got a Facebook message from Rob who wrote, I thought John Delancey was magnificent in this episode. The character arc of Q came to where I always thought it should go. And then uh, Paul on YouTube wrote, uh, my oddball theory about the transwarp gateway 
is that it's got nothing to do with Sung, but is the introduction of an intergalactic threat. I think they've run out of major Milky Way foes and are going to go bigger or at least further away for the next enemy. They'll do something with mm. Sung in the now born in the 1990s con. Uh, aren't there plans for a City Alpha series or something? But it's not going to be in Picard season three. I haven't you heard about a SETI Alpha series. Have you guys heard of that? Mm. No. no. Maybe, he's, mm. maybe he was kind of joking about that. But, uh -huh. uh, but the um, yeah, I think it's an, the idea of an extra galactic threat is interesting. Um, and they, they, you know, they certainly could do that at some point. And they could be doing that at this point. I'm not convinced that the Transwarp Corridor is, is for something connected with Sung. It, it may be. But um, but it also could be something else, including something extra galactic. Um, if they do that, so they already, in a way, they kind of did that in Picard season one, where it turns out there's a machine galaxy out there or something that effectively opened a transwarp corridor and mm -hmm. sent big Doc Ock tentacles waving through it. Mm -hmm. um, that they then pulled back after they said, no, no, we're okay. Um, but if they want to establish a longer term extra galactic threat, now they could always say it's from a part of the Milky Way we haven't really looked at. Like we've, we've been operating in the plane of the Milky Way and we have at least a little bit of knowledge of all four quadrants now, but maybe this is from the extreme galactic north or south. Or maybe it's from one of our satellite galaxies, like the Magellanic Clouds. We do know about the Kelvin Empire in Andromeda, because they dealt with that in the original right. series. But, um, but that was kind of a one-off. And if they want to build a series around a, an extragalactic threat, I would hope that they would establish some two-way thing. Because like when we had the Dominion War... I mean, essentially, the wormhole is a transwarp corridor going to the to the uh, to the gamma quadrant, mm -hmm. and and we got to explore the gamma quadrant and have some knowledge of it. It just wasn't it wasn't simply threat coming out of nowhere through a magic door, mm. and we never get to see what's on the other side of the magic door. It would be more interesting if you're gonna if you're gonna go extra galactic, establish something like the wormhole. That allows mm -hmm. two-way travel, so we can we can not just have a villain dropping in doing bad stuff that we don't really get a chance to see them in their own environment and understand them. Conduits are two-way though, right? The transwarp conduits, they're two-way. Yeah. 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 Um, the Discovery Season 4 had a extra galactic threat as part of that as well. Uh, oh, did it? Mm -hmm. But it wasn't from another galaxy. It was just, just outside our Right galaxy, outside. Outside the okay. barrier. Yep. Um, not so it's, it's this is this is evidence the Ori are coming. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's Stargate reference. So, so those more, don't know. Yeah, more feedback yeah. on the, the Ori were not as good as the Go Old. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, not at all. For uh, so more feedback, Kelly on Facebook wrote: For the most part, I like this season. I did enjoy it more than last season. I do agree that the ending was rushed. I was concerned that the entire season they were wasting a lot of time on certain plot threads and wouldn't have enough time to end it properly. I'm not sure it was ended properly. Overall, it ended pretty much as I expected it would. I did enjoy the final scene with Q. I also very much enjoyed the scene with Wesley. Yes, it was blatant fan service, but I'm fine with that. It made me smile. One major issue that it did ha I did have with the episode is Rios's ending. I wasn't surprised that he stayed in the 21st century. The show was blatantly telegraphing it from the moment he met Teresa. My issue is with the looming Third World War. Did they forget yeah. about that? Old mm. Guinan says that Teresa's son helped to heal the oceans with that stuff Renee brings back from space. When is this before or after the third world war begins and a good luck, a good chunk of the planet is dead. The show indicates that it was that that stuff that Renee brings back from space that begins to shape the future. Does that mean that things begin to get better and then the nukes start flying? Knowing what has been established from canon, what happens in the 21st century, Rios is ending is not that happy. Also, does Picard have the authority to grant the Borg membership in the Federation, even provisional membership? Don't they have the Federation Council? It seems like once Picard agreed, it was done. I assume that, so in terms, I, it depends on what you mean by provisional. That can have several different senses. Yeah. And maybe an admiral would have the ability to get, grant some kind of affiliation provisionally mm -hmm. with the Federation Council later voting on it. Yeah. And I just right. assume that that 
the vote will go through. It's kind of like right now when at time of recording, Finland and Sweden are talking about joining NATO and it's assumed that that's going to go through even though it's not a done deal at this point. And I would assume that right. that with given given what we know as fans of the series, the Federation Council will eventually approve some kind of membership for the for this group of Borg. Um, in yeah. terms of um, of the Third World War, I know he, this is a major unanswered question for me. It's like if you dropped me down in Berlin in 1937 and I met the the most attractive woman ever and wanted to build a life with her. I'm in Berlin in 1937. <laughs> yeah. You know what's going to happen in two years? I do. Yeah. So that it, that would be a major thing I would need to resolve one way or another. And they didn't address it at all, even though elsewhere they talk in the series about, oh, we've got this big disaster about to happen. Well, in, in the, the very timeline of the wars, the eugenics war and World War Three and all that, it's all being rewritten as these new series come out. Yeah. You know, because the last episode of Strange New World implied that in 2024 it hadn't happened yet, but it was getting there. Yeah. You know, but if you look, as I understand it, you know, going back to Space Seed and TOS, it, uh, the eugenics war happened in the 90s. Right. Or it would have happened by the time of 2024. So they're really they're they're messing with that part of the timeline. Of course, Doctor Who, we'd say it's all wibbly wobbly, timey wimey, <laughs> time war yeah. changed it all. but. Star Trek doesn't have that. Yeah. He's not supposed to. Yeah. I, I, if I were, if I were him, uh, I'd be heading to Wyoming. That's because apparently <laughs> Wyoming survives. Montana. Mo- is, Montana. It, is it in Montana that he is? Bozeman. Bozeman, yeah. Montana oh, is Bozeman, where first contact right. happens. Right. Uh, although Montana wouldn't survive World War Three, Father Corey. <laughs> you got all well, those nukes as, there. <laughs> yeah. I, I live three miles away from a nuke so <laughs> literally <laughs> yeah i think as far as the borg membership in the federation i, I like i said before i compare it to the or the age of sail these captains and admirals have a lot of leeway a lot of authority to speak on behalf of the federation uh, we saw it in tos we saw it in tng the captain negotiating treaties and doing all kinds of stuff uh, on his own so i i guess that's that's how i think of it all right, so then we have more feedback on our uh, discussion of the first episode of Strange New World, uh, where Rick on Facebook writes, first episode was fantastic. Actual Explorers, so much better than Discovery and Picard. Uh, I, 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 don't, I think we all agree on that. <laughs> uh, uh, it, it, at least my opinion was that was the, the best pilot. I think we talked about that, that it's, that's pretty much a unanimous vote in this yeah, panel. I think we all agreed that, that it was. Uh, then Dave via email says, uh, in your discussion of Strange New Worlds episode one, and specifically Spock's line to Pike, suffering can be transformed into insight. You talked about how this was sort of a Christian idea. To me, it read much closer to the way that suffering is addressed in Buddhism. Thoughts? Well, I, I, it didn't strike me that way. Um, in Buddhism, um, I mean, at least in Theravada Buddhism, which is the original form, um, suffering is regarded as a fundamental fact of human experience that needs to be avoided. And the way to avoid it is by um, is by a, is by practicing the eightfold path, where you have these different forms of balance you're seeking to pursue, with the ultimate goal of extinguishing desire, um, which will then extinguish suffering. Mm, and right. um, and I don't get a sense of of at least the forms of Buddhism that I'm familiar with of suffering being conceived of in a redemptive fashion. Right. Um, so maybe there are aspects of Buddhism I'm not aware of, but but even though Buddhism has suffering as a very prominent theme in its theology, it doesn't look at it the way Christians do. As you know, it mm-hmm. doesn't look at it as transform. You can transform suffering into insight or that sort of right. Thing. Right. Yeah. And, and that that seems that seems kind of like a, a secular humanist way of saying that you know suffering is redemptive. That it can redeem us. That it can can change us. Can you know? Of course, as, as Christians, we would say you know through suffering we can draw closer to Christ. We can join ourselves to His suffering on the cross. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, and so that it is it is a trans is something that while we might not desire it, it is that when it comes, it it is something that can be good for us in the long term and can can 
make us better people. And of course, again, you know, draw us closer to Christ and salvation. Mm. Uh, as we all know from Star Wars, mm, suffering leads to <laughs> anger. Anger leads to hate. Or is it the other uh, way around? Anger leads the other way around. Yeah, anger yeah. leads yeah. to hate. Hate leads to suffering, or hate leads to anger. As now, now I'm all as, confused no, about as, it. As, as Mr. Plinkett pointed out in his review of Phantom Menace, you can arrange those terms in any order you want. There is no <laughs> clear logical sequence there. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, as we saw, the, the Jedi at that at that point were were no <laughs> were not quite on top of their game. So yeah. In any case, thank you everyone for your feedback. We really appreciate it. We'd like to take a moment to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create Secrets of Star Trek, including Char Ducks, Anna H, Christy L, Ken M, and Blake P. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue the Secrets of Star Trek and all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. So that's it from us. We'd love to hear what you thought of Children of the Comet. You can let us know by commenting on the show at sqpn.com slash trek, our Facebook page at facebook.com slash starquestmedia, send an email to trek at sqpn.com, or visit our Discord community at sqpn.com slash discord. We'll be back next time when we'll be discussing the next new episode of Strange New Worlds called Ghosts of Illyria. Until then, Father Cory Stika, thank you for joining me and sharing the secrets of Star Trek. Thanks, Tom. Jimmy Aiken, thank you as well. Thank you, and live long and prosper. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to the secrets of Star Trek on StarQuest. And remember, sometimes things go so badly, you just have to laugh. Laugh.